Missing ships are a very eerie and interesting topic. Especially if a large vessel disappears. The idea that a huge man-made machine just dissolves into nothing can be very frightening. Tonight we cover one of these disappearances, namely the tragedy of the USS Cyclops. The USS Cyclops was the second of four Proteus-class colliers built for the United States Navy several years before World War I. Named for the Cyclops, a primordial race of giants from Greek mythology, she was the second U.S. naval vessel to bear the name. The loss of the ship and 306 crew and passengers without a trace sometime after March 4, 1918 remains the single largest loss of life in U.S. naval history not directly involving combat. The Cyclops was launched on May 7, 1910 by William Cramp and Sons of Philadelphia and placed in service on November 7, 1910, with Lieutenant Commander George Warley in command. Operating with the Naval Auxiliary Service, Atlantic Fleet, she voyaged in the Baltic from May to July 1911 to supply 2nd Division ships. Returning to Norfolk, Virginia, she operated on the East Coast from Newport, Rhode Island, to the Caribbean, servicing the fleet. During the United States occupation of Veracruz in Mexico in 1914-1915, she coaled ships on patrol there and received the thanks of the U.S. State Department for cooperation in evacuating refugees. With American entry into World War I, Cyclops was commissioned on May 1, 1917. She joined a convoy for saint nazaire France, in June 1917, returning to the U.S. in July. Except for a voyage to Halifax, Nova Scotia, she served along the East Coast until January 9, 1918, when she was assigned to the Naval Overseas Transportation Service. She then sailed to Brazilian waters to fuel British ships in the South Atlantic, receiving the thanks of the U.S. State Department and Commander-in-Chief. The ship put to sea from Rio de Janeiro on February 16, 1918, and entered Salvador on 20 February. Two days later, she departed for Baltimore, Maryland, with no stops scheduled, carrying the manganese ore. The ship was thought to be overloaded when she left Brazil, as her maximum capacity was 8,000 long tons. Before leaving port, Commander Warley had submitted a report that the starboard engine had a cracked cylinder and was not operative. This report was confirmed by a survey board, which recommended, however, that the ship be returned to the United States. She made an unscheduled stop in Barbados because the water level was over the Plimsoll line, indicating that it was overloaded. But investigations in Rio proved the ship had been loaded and secured properly. Cyclops then set out for Baltimore on 4th of March, and was rumored to have been sighted on 9th of March by the molasses tanker Amalco near Virginia, but this was denied by Amalco's captain. Additionally, because Cyclops was not due in Baltimore until 13 March, the ship was highly unlikely to have been near Virginia on 9th of March, as that location would have placed her only about a day from Baltimore. In any event, Cyclops never made it to Baltimore, and no wreckage of her has ever been found. Reports indicate that on 10th of March, the day after the ship was rumored to have been sighted by Amalco, a violent storm swept through the Virginia Capes area. While some suggest that the combination of the overloaded condition, engine trouble, and bad weather may have conspired to sink Cyclops, an extensive naval investigation concluded. Many theories have been advanced, but none that satisfactorily accounts for her disappearance. This summation was written, however, before two of Cyclops' sister ships, the Proteus and Nereus, vanished at sea during World War II. Both ships were transporting heavy loads of metallic ore similar to that which was loaded on Cyclops during her fatal voyage. In both cases, their loss was theorized to have been the result of catastrophic structural failure, but a more outlandish theory attributes all three vessels' disappearances to the Bermuda Triangle. Rear Admiral George Vanders suggested that the loss of Cyclops could be owing to structural failure, as her sister ships suffered from issues where the I-beams that ran the length of the ship had eroded due to the corrosive nature of some of the cargo carried. This was observed definitively on the USS Jason, and is believed to have contributed to the sinking of another similar freighter, Chucky, which snapped in two and calm seas. Moreover, Cyclops may have hit a storm with 30 to 40 knots. 
these would have resulted in waves just far enough apart to leave the bow and stern supported on the peaks of successive waves, but with the middle unsupported, resulting in extra strain on the already weakened central area. On June 1, 1918, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin D. Roosevelt declared Cyclops to be officially lost, and all hands deceased. One of the seamen lost aboard Cyclops was African-American mess attendant Lewis H. Hardwick, the father of Herbert Lewis Hardwick, the Coco Kid, an Afro-Puerto Rican welterweight boxer who was a top contender in the 1930s and 1940s, who won the World Colored Welterweight and World Colored Middleweight Championships. In 1918, a short summary of the loss of Cyclops was listed in the U.S. Navy Annual Report. For a BBC Radio 4 documentary, Tom Mangold had an expert from Lloyd's investigate the loss of Cyclops. The expert noted that manganese ore, being much denser than coal, had room to move within the holds even when fully laden, the hatch covers were canvas, and that when wet, the ore can become a slurry. As such, the load could shift and cause the ship to list. Combined with a possible loss of power from its one engine, it could founder in bad weather. But there was another rumor concerning the captain. Investigations by the Office of Naval Intelligence revealed that Captain Worley was born Johann Frederick Wichmann in Sandstedt, Hanover, Germany in 1862. The official Navy register lists his date of birth as December 11, 1865, and that he had entered America by jumping ship in San Francisco in 1878. By 1898, he had changed his name to Worley, after a seaman friend, and owned and operated a saloon in San Francisco's Barbary Coast. He also got help from brothers, whom he had convinced to emigrate. During this time, he had qualified for the position of ship's master, and had commanded several civilian merchant ships, picking up and delivering cargo, both legal and illegal. Some accounts say opium, from the Far East to San Francisco. Unfortunately, the crews of these ships reported that Worley suffered from a personality allegedly akin to that sometimes ascribed to HMS Bounty's Captain William Bly. With the crew often being brutalized by Worley for trivial things. Worley was commissioned as a lieutenant commander in the Naval Auxiliary Reserve on February 21, 1917. Naval investigators discovered information from former crew members about Worley's habits. He would berate and curse officers and men for minor offenses, sometimes getting violent. At one point, he had allegedly chased an ensign about the ship with a pistol. Worley sometimes would have an inexperienced officer in charge of loading cargo on the ship while the more experienced man was confined to quarters. In Rio de Janeiro, one such man was assigned to oversee the loading of manganese ore, something a collier was not used to carrying, and in this instance the ship was overloaded, which may have contributed to her sinking. The most serious accusation against Worley was that he was pro-German in wartime and may have colluded with the enemy. Indeed, his closest friends and associates were either German or Americans of German descent. Many Germanic names appear, Livingston stated, speculating that the ship had many German sympathizers on board. One of the passengers on the final voyage was Alfred Louis Moreau Gottschalk, the Consul General in Rio de Janeiro, who was as roundly hated for his pro-German sympathies, as was Worley. Livingston stated he believed Gottschalk may have been directly involved in collaborating with Worley on handing the ship over to the Germans. After World War I, German records were checked to ascertain the fate of Cyclops, whether by Worley's hand or by submarine attack. Nothing was found. How could the biggest ship in the U.S. Navy vanish without trace? This was the question on many people's minds in March 1918, when the enormous vessel, the USS Cyclops, disappeared on a voyage between the West Indies to Baltimore. A century on, it's no closer to being answered. In a feature published a couple of years after the ship's disappearance, Santa Fe magazine described the strangeness of the disappearance. Usually a wooden bucket or a cork life preserver identified as belonging to a lost ship is picked up after a wreck but not so with the Cyclops, they reported. She just disappeared as though some gigantic monster of the sea had grabbed her, man and all, and sent her into the depths of the ocean. 
and the suddenness of her destruction is amplified by the absence of any wireless calls for help being picked up by any ship along the route. Throughout the decades, there have been a flurry of sometimes sensational theories about the ship's disappearance. As one among more than 100 ships and planes to have mysteriously disappeared in the so-called Bermuda Triangle, the region roughly bounded by Bermuda, Miami, and Puerto Rico. Was the ship eaten by some beast of the deep, carried off as evidence by UFOs, or simply scuppered by a storm? Some still cling to investigations, particularly those with a personal connection to the ship. Marvin Barash is the descendant of one of the firefighters aboard the ship. He has spent more than a decade researching its history, painstakingly gathering Navy records, ship logs and any ephemera that might come in useful, including the black and bag of manganese ore. The whole existence of the ship has been swept under a rug, he told the Baltimore Sun. It wasn't like it was lost in a glorious battle. It just kind of fell off the face of the earth. Barash has his own suspicions about what happened to this lost colossus, a series of mechanical failures, a crew unused to the new heavy cargo, and a final great rolling wave that tipped the ship and her passengers into the ocean forever. All of this, he thinks, may have coincided with the ship passing over the Puerto Rico Trench, the deepest part of the Atlantic, where she would be near irretrievable. Despite his misgivings, Barash retains some hope that the ship will be discovered, especially as undersea exploration technology improves. There are fewer and fewer lost shipwrecks every year, with high-tech devices spotting vessels believed to be gone for good. The Cyclops may be next on the list. I just want her to be found, Barash said. I want the 309 to be at rest, as well as the families. It's something everybody needs, some resolution. I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Please consider subscribing, so we can entertain and educate you with more peculiar stories. Post in the comments below which mystery would you like us to cover next and maybe your topic will be in an upcoming episode. Have a nice, calm night shift.